seminar today. As a registered dietitian, I'm sure that it's not a surprise that I would say that eating produce has been very well documented as being one of the healthiest things that you can do and one of the best parts of a beneficial diet. One of the things that we know about fruits and vegetables is they provide us vitamins and minerals. They also provide us with these little hidden things called lycopenes and lutein known as phytochemicals and also antioxidants. So eating a lot of fruits and vegetables in our diet is being it's very well linked to having less incidence of high blood pressure, less incidence of many forms of cancer, and also lowering our risk of heart disease. So but there's a lot of benefits out there for having fruits and vegetables. So much so that most of our government officials out there have really changed that whole pyramid that you might have seen in the past to now what's called the My Plate picture that you see up here where more fruits and vegetables are highly encouraged. We need to have at least half of our plate filled with fruits and vegetables every day to have all those beneficial attributes of fruit in there. And of course a lot of the health organizations agree that that is what we should be doing. Now on the downside, in addition to being a registered dietitian, I'm a certified food safety professional. And while we want to eat more fruits and vegetables, we also know that a lot of fruits and vegetables are linked with foodborne illness outbreaks. You might hear every day about cantaloupes, tomatoes, spinach, bagged lettuce, jalapenos, raspberries, all linked to ongoing foodborne illness outbreaks. As a matter of fact, of the 46 million cases of foodborne illness every year, at least 46% of those can be attributed to the produce that we eat. So while I, as a dietitian, want you to eat more produce, I want you to eat more produce safely. So I want to take you on a little bit of journey today on how food can get unsafe, but the bottom line that I want you to take home with you is that while there are risks to eating produce, that the health benefits significantly outweigh any of the food safety risks that are out there. I want you to eat more produce, and I want to help you to eat more produce in a safe manner, and to provide safe produce, again, to your customers and clients. So that journey really is what the food industry calls from farm to fork. If you think about the whole journey that a piece of lettuce, an apple, a carrot might take from the time it's raised up on the farm until it winds up on your plate, a lot of opportunities exist for food to become unsafe, for it to become contaminated. From the farm, to the harvesters, to the packers, to the shippers, to the food service distributor or grocery store that you might purchase that food from, and then to your hands and food handlers that might put that food on plate. There are many, many opportunities for contamination. With that in mind, our government has great oversight to the produce industry. The Food and Drug Administration has specific rules and regulations that ensure that food that is being produced on the farm is as safe as it possibly can. And on the other hand, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has what are called Good Agricultural Practices, or GAPs, and Good Handling Practices, or GHPs. If you think about that, the GAPs are the pre-harvest part of food safety, and the GHPs are the post-harvest part of food safety. So Good Agricultural Practices and the planting, and then the Good Handling Practices from harvest forward. There are audits that the U.S. Department of Agriculture and many third-party auditors do to go into our farms to make sure, again, that specific things are being done to have safe produce come to us as consumers. So let's think about how produce actually can become unsafe. Well, a very well-known outbreak happened not too many years ago in 2011 related to water contamination. In 23 states, bag romaine salad was recalled because of E. coli. If we think about where E. coli comes from, it's usually in the gastrointestinal tract of humans and animals. And this specific outbreak was traced back to the irrigation water that was put on that romaine lettuce 
while it was in the field. Unbeknownst to the farmer, 20 miles upstream was the largest cattle lot in the country. And because of runoff of refuse from that cattle lot, running into the canals that were downstream or upstream from where the water was being used to irrigate that water, fecal laden water was used to irrigate this lettuce. So there's specific guidelines that are out there really dictate that farms need to purchase or provide irrigation water that is safe, clean, drinkable, potable water, just like we would drink out of a spigot. And for that reason, it has to be tested periodically for coliform bacteria, that's essentially fecal bacteria, or the presence or absence of that. So a lot of things can happen. If you think about right here in the state of North Carolina, if you're ever driving out in the country, you might see on a hot July afternoon cows standing in ponds like this. And those very ponds may be used to irrigate <coughs> crops. So that would be something that a good agricultural practice auditor would identify and have the farmer correct so that that water would not be used for irrigation. And in addition to that, making sure that people are not using that water, the irrigation canals for swimming, clothes washing, or anything which we might see in third world countries, and that those sources are kept clean. So water can be a source, and we've got guidelines in place to ensure that water can't be a problem. Now the land use and what goes into the soil can also be an issue. As a matter of fact, we might even be thinking it might be a good time for us to start purchasing organic produce. But just this past June, we had an outbreak of e. Oh, hepatitis A related to organic raspberries that were being farmed. And what was happening is improperly composted manure was being put on those raspberries against the regulations out there. So there are specific guidelines for compost and manure and any other type of soil additive to make sure that it is safe and it's put on the soil at the right time. Let me just go into the quick guidelines. Any raw manure cannot be put onto the soil 14 days prior to planting or within two, 120 days of harvest. So that's when that can't be used. The reason for that is that many of our plants can absorb the germs that are in the soil or in the compost or manure into their root system or while as the plant is growing into the leafy filaments there can actually get compacted in there. So that's the reason that we have specific guidelines for the use of any type of soil additive including uh, compost and manure. Now the equipment can also be an issue. If you think about this particular tractor that today is being used to haul manure maybe out to one field, those same tractor wheels may be the ones that are being used to pull this freshly harvested produce into the packing house. So the cleanliness specifically of all the equipment, the bins that food goes in, all need to be cleaned and sanitized, whether it's inside or outside, and then protected from additional contamination. That very well was the specific thing that happened with Jensen Farms, who is now going through some specific legal action because of the listeria outbreak with their cantaloupe manufacturing, where over 33 people died from this listeria contamination. It was the unclean, dirty packing house with very old, aged, hard to clean equipment that led to the accumulation of listeria that couldn't be cleaned off of that equipment. So the cleanliness of every part of equipment, the tools, the buildings, are also a specific part of those USDA guidelines and FDA guidelines. Now, that huge outbreak related to spinach that we had in 2006, I was out in the middle of California whenever that specific thing happened and wow, we couldn't get salads anywhere because there was such a scare. They really didn't know what component of the salad it was, but they finally traced it back to spinach. And how the spinach got contaminated was feral pigs that decided to go out and have a picnic in the spinach fields. And while they were having a picnic, they were leaving fecal matter behind as well. So the guidelines specifically say that we need to have what are called reasonable controls 
over domestic as well as wild animals so that they don't get into the harvest fields and be a, a problem, problem with contamination. Now, what, whenever I say reasonable, it's really not reasonable to think that migratory birds can be controlled as they're flying mm -hmm. over fields, but there's been a lot of research that shows migratory bird patterns and E. coli outbreaks. So as reasonable as possible, for example, just fencing off chickens or putting a fence off so that deer couldn't get into fields to leave fecal matter behind. Now with that in mind, the last thing that we have to think about beyond the water and the soil and the animals out there are, is the human component. Does anybody, it might be an age thing, how many of you remember this restaurant, a Mexican style restaurant called Chi Chi's? Just a quick raise of your hands. When was the last time you saw a Chi Chi's restaurant? Chi Chi's actually went bankrupt because of a hepatitis A outbreak linked to green onions that were served on their menu that were acquired from unapproved fields in Mexico. Whenever they went to the fields to do some of the testing, what they found were hand dug latrines where the harvesters were going to the bathroom in the field. And from the hand dug pits that they found, they were able to trace back specific fields and the hepatitis A virus that was in those latrines. And of course that got into every bit of the wrapping of that green onion. You couldn't have cooked it out if you had wanted to, but unfortunately that was served raw as a sprinkling on top of almost every entree that they had. 650 people that ate at those particular restaurants came down with hepatitis A. So very devastating. As a result, they went bankrupt. They couldn't weather that storm specifically. And the guidelines specifically say that whether the produce is foreign or domestic, that we need to have hygiene practices in place. For example, porta johns not just porta johns but porta johns on wheels that will follow the harvesters throughout the fields so that when the call of nature comes, they have a place to go. And they also have hand washing sinks to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. So just specific basic guidelines from a human hygiene standpoint can prevent huge outbreaks of many different types of pathogens. Now the Food Safety Modernist Act Modernization Act, or FISMA, as you may hear, is coming on with even better regulations, more stringent requirements for audits, more stringent requirements for producers of produce to make sure that our produce is even safer from this point forward. And they're really looking specifically at the growing and harvesting and packaging of that produce and all of the, the rules that we can put in place. Now, there are some limitations to the Food Safety Modernization Act. Again, you might be thinking organic is the way to go, or wow, I'm just going to start buying all my produce right down the street at the local farmer's market. Unfortunately, the Food Safety Modernization Act does not touch many of those small truck farms that you may consider purchasing from. A specific example is if any farm sells less than $250,000, they're exempt from the new rules and regulations. They don't have to comply with the water safety, with the hygiene safety, with the soil safety requirements that we've talked about. And for those little bit larger farms that are selling about less than $500,000, if they're selling to specific limited end users, for example, to just one or two restaurants, or specifically only to a farmer's market, again, those larger truck farms don't have to comply with those guidelines. So there are plenty of rules out there. There are more rules that are coming up that will help produce safe food. Now, you may be thinking, what do I do? Well, if you're working in an operation and you're thinking about purchasing locally, you yourself may want to require those farms to have a good agricultural practice or GAP audit, or you yourself may want to have them fill out a specific checklist that's provided by the University of Iowa to certify them as a safer food source to ensure that they are complying with some of the basic guidelines that are out there. That being said, purchasing from what's called a safe and reputable supplier 
is the best thing that most food service operators can do to ensure that the food that they provide is safe. That food service distributor is making sure that all of their specific operators are jumping through all the good agricultural practice hoops, requiring those audits, requiring product liability insurance, and also ensuring that that food is safe. So with that, I will conclude this first segment and in our second, second segment of the afternoon, we will go into what you, the operator, specifically can do in your operation to keep that produce you've purchased from a safe and reputable supplier safe until it gets to the plate. <laughs>